Okay, so this is uh, China the Middle Kingdom. It's a Britannia style game. For whatever reason, and I've mentioned this if you've been following my other coverage of Britannia style games, I'm not a huge fan of these, but I seem to collect them. <laughs> and they actually, so I don't really respect them very much, but there's a certain pleasure I take in playing them. Uh, there's a comfort food sort of game to them that I like. This one's uh, a little bit more Britannia-like than Invasions or, for that matter, Italia or uh, Hispania, which I haven't gotten around to yet, which was, I think, actually the second one I owned, um, although I'd played others uh, before. Well, I'd played Maharaja. Uh, and this one covers China. Um, Let's take a look at the components a little bit because, uh, whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, territories, yeah, the map's kind of an ugly uh, uh, print job. It reminds me a little bit of the uh, China Warlords of Disarray map, not just because the province is being largely the same. Uh, it, it, it's a different size map, but the c kind of bright colors and all that. I don't think that really helps much. Um, I'm not sure why the color choices were made that were made. And clearly, you know, it's easy to distinguish one province from the other. But it becomes sort of a colorful mass. Um, you have this huge turn order chart. There are a lot of countries in this game. And some of those countries are really pretty tiny and don't look like they serve a lot of purpose. From what I read of comments on BGG, that is what people's impression is. You have your population chart track where you keep track of um, the number of areas that you have basically produces a reinforcement um, value. And basically, this is the same as in Britannia. Each clear area produces one point, each mountainous area produces a half point. Once you get to three points, you get a reinforcement army on the map. Um, hmm turn tracks up here. How about that? There's this whole, this is kind of neat. All the reinforcements are slated on this little section of the map. Now, I was going to throw the rules there, and I may end up doing that and moving a lot of this stuff up to the turn track so that's kind of out of my way because I could use that, uh, that real estate for better things. The counters themselves are pretty much, uh, for the most part, just individual armies, nothing on the back. Um, a lot of different colors. Again, presentation-wise, not the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, and then you have, uh, well, you have these which handle this, not necessarily terribly easy to align. You know, you find them by name. One of the problems is some of the kingdoms have very, very similar names, both in spelling and... Uh, <laughs> how they look and you know China is not something that's gotten a lot of attention in general in the gaming public and it's exciting to see something you know a Britannia style treatment of the Chinese uh, situation but some of the naming is just difficult to deal with and it's also hard to read the counters um, you know you know, zooming in with the, the camera, I can do it, but uh, it's hard on my eyes. Um, you got score sheets. And ugh, a couple of these. They provide you with a couple of cardstock ones if you want to use those. But I made some photocopies. Uh, the cardstock doesn't look much better. It's just not as wrinkly. Uh bunch of reserve counters here. Some interesting things. So when some of the uh, the European powers start coming in, or Japan, uh, they want to create these sort of economic zones, and we'll see the rules on that. Um, you got your communists and nationalists. This goes all the way from Bronze Age China to the end of World War II and the, uh, the communist revolution. Um, sort of the the pride and joy of this game is these tarot-sized cards for each of the nations. And they're really well, you know, very pretty. 
And then another kind of nice thing that I didn't expect was a nice little eh, primer on, you know, the broad Chinese history, all presented in one place. You know, I've got, uh, <laughs> actually I picked one up there, but these you run into these world history type books and things like that in, in you know, in various schooling situations, even through college, where they're very broad overviews. And it might contain all, much of the information in that pamphlet, but it probably doesn't contain it all in one place. And so this gives you kind of a nice uh, feel for um, something that a lot of us Western gamers probably don't have that kind of in sort of naturally acquired or whatever um, concept of the the broad scope of Chinese history. I don't know if I terribly do after having read that either, um, but I have more than I had, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, this current loss box is kind of important because every time you, and this is a mechanical nightmare in the game, every time you fight a battle in the game, um, each player has one chip that they can use once per game that says, yeah, I didn't like the results of that battle, <laughs> and resets it. Um, that's, to me, a little, it's an ugly mechanism, um, is I guess the best I can say. You've got these off-board areas, Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, India, Myanmar, quite a few of them actually, where invading armies come from. And they can also come off the Pacific Ocean and just stage, you know, there to go onto the map. They can't stay there and no one can enter these. Um, I, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a mechanism that allows you to do the invasions. There would be other ways of doing it. Um, it's simple enough though. The rule book itself seemed okay. Uh, some of it kind of got blurry in my head though. So I am going to work through it. There are a few interesting uh, new concepts. By the way, there's two of those counters. Each player has two counters. One of them allows them to refight the battle. The other one gives them a bonus in the battle. And over the scope of the game, you've got to decide when it's worth spending that once Per game chip. There's another thing that's a little weird. Uh, they're also represented on these cards. Uh, you have to cut the cards to make them useful and there's no way I'm going to destroy those cards. Uh, another thing that's in play is there's these multicolored kingdoms um, or countries that are sort of weird uh, situations in China where things were really, really balkanized. Um, and there would be a lot of different powers broken up and they had some military force and some capabilities, but uh, they didn't really, um, they, didn't, they never really coalesced into a singular power and they're represented there and they, they take a kind of, the designer takes a kind of interesting uh, tack with those, which is to play them out split between a couple of players, where both players get to use these powers for something, and they get to score points for them. Um, and the points are kind of split, and we'll see how that works. So uh, it's not like the Angles and Saxons in Invasions, which, <laughs> uh, which kind of, you know, hey, you take the points and you just split them down the middle. Instead, what happens is points that you gain during the turn, like, for killing stuff, you get, if you're the one controlling the country. Points that the country generates for existing, both players get in full, which um, I kind of like. I don't know. Like all of these games, um, you kind of walk into it and, and you might screw it up completely. Like, you kind of have to know the pattern of the game. Um, before you can play it well. So you have to play through it once or twice, and I haven't done that. Uh, so 
you're going to see some beginner blunders, as it were, in terms of acquiring victory points. And if you, if you want to think about that in Britannia terms, if you're familiar with that, uh, the best example I can have with that is with the Danes. When the Danes are coming on the board, if everybody is just kind of spreading out and getting their own points and doesn't pay attention to the point to the fact that the Danes are coming with a huge invasion, they just sweep over the map and take everything and get huge points. On the other hand, everybody can kind of form a wall along the coast and not go after their own points and kind of agree to be peaceable you know, to resist the Danes, and they can present quite a uh, potent barrier against them. And that kind of foreknowledge about what's coming in uh, is important in Britannia for, you know, depending on the situation, you may, may or may not need to do that. Um, depending on how well the green player who owns the Danes in my version. Later versions, they change the colors. Earlier versions, they change the colors. I got the Avalon Hill version. So let's take a look um, at what we have here. There are some specific areas. Hainan and Taiwan, uh, the islands, are not available until a certain turn. So like this says from turn six, Taiwan doesn't even have that listed there. Hainan is just considered next to Guangdong uh, as it is, but Taiwan is only available by boat, and I think it's actually basically restricted by when, you, when players have boats <clears throat> more than anything else. Uh, we have a few more things on the map. We have the Great Wall, which presents something of a military advantage to the defenders beyond it. You have the Great Canal, or Grand Canal, which allows for movement um, that's a little faster through a few provinces. Um, the Yangtze River uh, prevents certain player, and it's basically represented by this dark blue line. To mark the provinces, certain countries are limited to being only within one north or south of the river. <clears throat> uh, the reinforcement box, it says it's used to temporarily hold reinforcements before they enter the game. Um, I've got them over here, sort of, kind of. Uh, maybe it makes sense to put one turn's reinforcements up there. I don't know. Uh, do, 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 do. The moves box in the lower right-hand corner of the board. Huh. Yeah? Oh, yeah, this is the turn notes thing. And the loss box, this is important. Um, actually, okay, so this is more, more complicated than I thought. I thought the current loss box was to hold the losses from every uh, given battle. Um, it's actually a way to just count losses. They suggest it as a way to count losses um, that you've defeated in the course of your player curtain so that you can score them. Something has to be done to make sure that you keep all the losses from the current battle um, separate, though. And that's what I thought it was for. Okay. Uh... Okay. There are emperor markers who come in with certain invasions, and they provide, again, like in most Britannia games, they're like leaders. They provide a certain amount of uh, some military advantages. Um, the country scoring card has a number of pieces of information on it. Uh, when the, you know, how, how it enters the game, so these guys start the game with a couple of pieces, what score they get, so this gets points for killing certain armies uh, during any game turn, but only during attack, which means only when that player's taking his turn. And then on turn three, the, which is a scoring turn, basically every three turns in this game is a scoring turn, there are a fair amount of turns. Um, they'll get points for each plane in each highland area that they're in. Uh, what about these other values? Well, that's a good question. Total is how many counters they have. Uh, order is where they are 
in the turn order. And sequence is the order huh, that they come into play for that player. Now, th they're not right. <laughs> it's that simple. So this is given sequence two, but shows up on turn three. Um, and this is given sequence three and shows up on turn two. And I, I found that the cards were stacked in sequence order when I got them, but the sequence order is just wrong. So that's kind of interesting. Um, okay. Uh, this game, unlike most, well, unlike many Britannia style games, allows you to start to play the game in half sections. So you've got the full, full history of China, or you can have the early history or the late history, um, basically split by turn 13. <clears throat> um, the regular sequence is you look and see who's going to take their turn next, um, going down in order. Uh, and de -de 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 um, once all the countries have moved in a given turn, if there's none left, you know, because they kind of come in in order, if you get to the end of the list of current countries, you move the turn marker forward and take care of any fixes. Now, when each country goes, the first thing you do is you count the population points. For the most part, most countries, but not all, uh, count, um, like I said, one point for each plains area they have, a half point for each mountain area. That will generate population points. Once For every multiple of three, they'll get a reinforcement army that comes in. Uh, reinforcement army gets put in the reinforcement box, and then any armies that you're supposed to get from this and any reinforcement armies get placed. Um... They're a little weird. Sometimes they use the word armies instead of countries, and there's a couple little weird things like that in the game, uh, in the rulebook. Uh, so you have to place the units into a space that already has armies of that nation, and like in all Britannia games, um, with all these countries that you have, they're not considered allied in any sense. You may want to operate them in a way that's friendly to each other for the most part, so you maximize your points. But you can attack your own countries. Uh, the emperors are removed at the beginning of the country's next turn, so they stay on the board for one turn, basically. Uh, some countries switch to other countries in the midst of the game, and you'll see this uh, in Hispania, a little bit of an in invasions. Um, these new countries may be a different player's ownership. They have a different card. They have different counters, etc. But basically, all the original armies, uh, countries' armies, are just replaced with armies in the new country. Now, like most Britannia games, um, and not like invasions, and maybe not. Maybe not like Hispania and Italia, which kind of take a half measure view on it. Um, the armies on the board are not just military. They're your population, too. But it's sort of a mixed thing, right? Uh, if I've got one piece in a plains, it produces one population point. If I've got the same piece in the mountains, it produces half of one. Uh, a whole bunch of pieces somewhere. It's not like in Civilization where a bunch of pieces actually, you know, produce a larger bunch of pieces and populate, you know, by normal population mathematics. Nah, it's something kind of abstract somewhere, somewhere between things. It shows both control but also uh, possibly density because if you get enough of these pieces, you kind of have to spread out. Uh, because of the stacking rules. One of the things I was kind of hoping for as I started reading, uh, you know, uh, some of the information about um, the Chinese dynasties and thought about it in, in uh, connection with invasions was, hey, maybe this is the game, and it's not, <laughs> where they represent um, populations and armies separately. 
or represent populations correctly and maybe abstract armies away or something like that. It isn't, but it's beginning to look, to me, China seems like almost the perfect place to capture that. And one thing in particular about that is in Invasions, I started thinking that the game was trying to represent peoples as distinct from military forces. And thus, subjugated armies were kind of, or subjugated groups were kind of yours, but they aren't really in invasions. And in here, yeah, there's nothing like that, so <laughs> don't worry about it. But one of the things I was thinking about is you have peoples like the Uyghurs who, you know, moved in at a certain time and, uh, are still there, you know? <laughs> they didn't disappear. They got absorbed. To some extent, there's an assimilation process, but it's not complete by any means. And you have sort of this population problem that crops up where there's a different culture or something that is long lasting and sometimes it can be quiescent and is happy with what's going on, and sometimes it's not. And to represent that kind of cultural identity within a larger empire um, is something that seems almost perfect for China because you have multiple cultural identities that, and, and it makes sense with Rome too, but the thing with Rome is, um, well, with invasions, is that you're not coming upon the assimilation of the different cultures. You are with the Franks and with some of the barbarian tribes. You're more looking at, you know, the dissolution <coughs> and less of that cultural assimilation is happening. But throughout the entire history of China it seems like a perfect canvas to try that out. And I'm kind of considering some ways of dealing with uh, that concept of there being populations that are distinct from the rulership of the population. And you've got stuff like that in empires of the Middle Ages, right, where you've got territories that are populated by a certain uh, people. But what I was really interested in was that migration of populations settling down and then becoming um, absorbed into a larger into a, into a state that doesn't necessarily match their culture uh, and what, what could be done to represent that in a more accurate and believable fashion. And Well, we just wandered off into nowhere. I'm kind of, yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, sometimes countries will just get removed from the board and replaced with something. And the Uyghurs are an example of that. They actually get absorbed into the Mongols, I believe. And then they're just gone, you know, <laughs> um, which is a little odd. There's a, some new mechanisms for bringing countries into play that I have not seen in any other uh, of the Britannia-style games. For example, rebellions. Um, there are some countries that come in as a rebellion, and you kind of randomly determine which province that they are allowed to rebel against, um, that they show up in, and they give some mechanisms for that. If there's loyal armies in that province, the province becomes the center of the rebellion. If no loyal armies are present, uh, the dice are rolled again until you find another one. Sometimes there could be multiple rebellion centers. All of the loyal armies in those provinces are just replaced by the rebel country. Okay, that sounds sort of like a replacement situation, but it's not 100%. But then for each province containing loyal armies that is adjacent to a rebellion center, the rebel player then rolls a die. Um, and if you roll higher than the power factor, I haven't talked about those. Those are those numbers here, and they're also on all the counters. And they're sort of the victory... I, I don't know quite what to represent, what to call them. They're not well described anywhere, but they are the victory points that you get for destroying that nation or for killing an emperor of that nation. What else are they? Yeah, I'm not sure. They might be a representation of the overall expectation of points for a country or something like that, or the overall power of a country. Um, neither case looks like it's a correct alignment, but... They are the points you get for wiping that country out. 
Um, so if you roll higher than the original nation's power factor, um, the armies of that faction remain loyal. If you go lower or equal, then they join the rebellion and the forces are replaced. Uh, if there's an emperor, he can be placed in any province containing rebel armies. The emperor can wait until all the rebels have been determined. <coughs> there's a special kind of rebellion, the Three Kingdoms Rebellion. During turn five, the Han Dynasty splits into three countries, Shu, Wu, and Wei. Uh, thus, the three different rebellion uh, centers occur, one for each nation, and the rebellions occur simultaneously. This is handled, um, the Shu first rebel, and you hit all adjacent areas, so they could actually get a bigger territory from that. Um, but they're limited to being in a Han province starting with a one. Then the Wu go, and they're limited to one starting with a two. I don't know what happens if there isn't one. Um, oh, there we go. They start in any... Uh, and then the uh, uh, way show up in any one starting with a three. And that, you know, distinguishes where you're going to show up. Now, the three is kind of weird. So you got 30 here. Wow, they can't show up at 30, though, because you roll a d6. So, like, they'll show up at 33, 34, 35, 36. But it's disjointed. So you don't necessarily, like, it's not guaranteed that you're going to sh st show up in one particular um, regional area. <coughs> Do I see a 31? Mm -hmm. 33, 34, 35, 36, 30. <laughs> uh... I do not see a 31 or 32. I, I don't know if they're there or... Interesting. Very odd. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what's up with that. That is not the numbering that I would have expected from this. Um, Yeah, there is no province 21. Yeah, interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, so they may actually be a little bit more physically centered. There's the 20s. Uh, the 30s we already looked at. The 1s are all in here. Yeah, okay. So they are kind of physically uh, divided. Um, all right. And that'll create three rebellions within the hand. The hand don't disappear unless they're completely destroyed. At the start of turn 24, there's the Chinese Civil War, and that's the end of the game that's, uh, you know, the World War II turn, basically. Um, each province that contains at least one nationalist or communist army, which both come in as uprisings in one area, at random, uh, uh, the nationalists have eroded their populist uh, base, so they will be making loyalist checks on all of their provinces uh, the same way that adjacent territories to the uprising do, and will likely turn communist instead of nationalist. Okay. That was just the rules for placing things on the board. Moving armies. Okay, well, everything has two movement points. But if it moves into um, an occupied in a province, a uh, province occupied by a, another nation, it has to stop. There's an exception to that. If you outnumber it by at least two to one, you can send additional armies through. And then there's exceptions. The Qing and Yuan have special rules. They have invasions where they're allowed to go through a one-to-one -one basis uh, rather than two-to-one. In Highlands, if you enter a mountainy province, um, you must stop. But again, the Yuan have a special rule where they can ignore that. 
there's a roll for the Great Wall that's similar. Well, no, it's combat oriented. The Emperors. The Emperor allows you to move three provinces instead of two. Uh, the emperor must be with an army, so it's not like Britannia where you can just throw a leader off and say, I control this area. Um, in fact, if he does end up alone, even without enemy armies due to a battle, uh, mutual elimination, um, he's considered killed by that enemy army that he just defeated. And you're just not allowed to leave him alone. Uh, Hainan, turn six, it becomes available to move between Guangdong and Hainan. Uh, there's no special rules there in terms of like straight crossing rules that show up in some of these. Boats. You, with boats you can move through the Pacific o Ocean, which is treated as a single area, no matter how big it is. Some countries do not receive boats until a specific turn. Uh, armies cannot, and that'll be marked uh, on their card or on their counter, well, and on their counter. So if we look at the Qing, they have boats starting turn 19. It's actually on the counter. It's a lot of information. <laughs> you know, the game doesn't have... These games usually don't have a lot of information on the counters. Invasions accepted, which is sort of not really one of these. Uh, it's a half, half attempt to... Uh, it, it does some Britannia-like things, but then makes them more complex than is at all reasonable for a Britannia-style game. Um, Hispania already did that, and Invasions is like, you know, let's, instead of just multiplying, you know, the level of difficulty, let's raise it to a power. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, it counts as one move, and you're not allowed to stop in the Pacific Ocean. So basically, you know, you can sail somewhere, but whatever. Uh, foreign concessions. At any point in a turn, if Britain, Russia, France, or Germany are the only units in a Chinese province, they force a foreign concession on the Chinese government. Uh, they get a marker there. There's a trade treaty forced on the government, and um, the big deal there is that other people can't play concessions uh, where there's already one and they provide victory points um, at the end of the turn. On turn 24, they disappear because World War II. <laughs> uh, we got some notes on the geography here. Hang Henan and Jiangsu are met by a thin strip of land. Let's see if I can find. Uh, I'm not good at this. I know there's one here where Gangsu and Inner Mongolia are connected without wall. Even though there's wall all along there, there's a way to slip in without the wall. Um, trying to find these others. Hainan. And... Is that Jiangsu? Yes. Okay, so even though this looks like it's a corner here, these two are connected, these two are not. Ah, uh, yeah, that needed to be spelled out. If anything, I would guess the opposite, the way the map looks. Uh, Nixia, border, Nixia borders Shanxi. Okay, I don't know where these are. Uh, there's Shanxi. And Ningxia is here, and you can see that border very clearly. I mean, I would look at this board and say, these two are adjacent, and these two are not. Wow. Um, and Inner Mongolia and Jiangsu. Jilin borders the Pacific Ocean. This little space here. Most of it is pretty obvious. The one is just, it looks opposite on the map. We'll go with what they say. I can remember. Okay. Resolving battles. Uh, a little bit more complicated than Britannia, but not a whole hell of a lot. Uh, it's still buckets of dice game. So, in general, the attacker needs to roll a four. You basically get one die per army. 
uh, in a battle area. And the attacker needs to roll fours or higher to hit. The defenders, though, need a five or higher. Immediately, there's a disadvantage to the defender. There's usually one in the game because the attacker just moved, so they can get like two to one odds and almost assure themselves victories. But it goes more than that here. Uh, there are some modifications, however, and it's possible to modify uh, rolls above a six or below a zero. I'm assuming, yeah, it's or higher. So, yeah, it could be possible that units cannot hit each other. And I have to stop because my fucking camera has run out of battery juice again. Um, my old one didn't used to eat it this way. I have to be careful because uh, my wife yells at me if I start talking as loudly as I was um, this late at night. Okay. Uh, some of the modifiers to combat. Um, if you're in the Highlands, the attacking armies get minus two to their die rolls. That puts them up to the normal have to roll sixes to hit uh, from Britannia. However, the Yuan, um, the defensive armies lose that benefit and can be hit on a three or higher. The Yuan have special abilities. Um, an Emperor. An Emperor gives a plus one bonus to all die rolls and a minus one penalty to all opposing die rolls uh, in the same province. If two Emperors battle each other, uh, they cancel out, and that's only Shankatschak and Mal. The Great Wall. If you're crossing the Great Wall, you take a minus one to your attack die rolls, but you can make this attack without crossing the Great Wall. The Yuan, however, can ignore the Great Wall. <laughs> uh, and again, the Yuan is, uh, is the Mongols. Uh, the foreign powers. They have more powerful armies, and they need a three or higher when they're attacking another army. If they're defending uh, their territories, they hit on a four or higher instead of a five, and they can only be eliminated on a six or higher, whether they're attacking or defending. That includes when two foreign powers attack each other. The Yuan. On turn 15, the Yuan attack as if they were a foreign power. Um, they ignore Highland's Great Wall, and armies opposing the Yuan in turn 15 do not get a defensive bonus due to either. Uh, inventions. Once per turn, you can use your invention card. Well, like I said, each player has a bonus. Here's the invention bonus and the leader bonus. Basically, um, the names and whatever are just there for color. Um, you basically have, you have the cards, you also have counters, and I'll be using the counters to represent these and just uh, slap them down, uh, discard them when I use them. Um, they will give a plus one to all the attacking armies' die rolls uh, for the duration of that battle. Now, that's the duration of a battle. A battle can be multiple rounds, uh, so that, I'm taking it that way. Okay, once per game, each player can use a hero card or counter um, during or immediately after a battle. The hero card resets the entire battle. The original attacking and defending armies and emperors are restored back, and the battle is played completely over. And... Again, this is a once per game thing, both of them are. Uh, making the decision of when it's important to do that is gonna be hard without having seen the game play through before. You roll the dice, um, and you see how many points of damage you did. And for each hit that you make, you destroy one of the enemy armies. And you might get points for them. Emperors don't count and can't be killed that way. They can only be killed by wiping out the army they're with. Then the defender has the option to retreat, and they can retreat into any adjacent provinces that contain only armies of the same country. Uh, they can't retreat into empty provinces. Most importantly, they can't retreat into a battle that's currently undergoing, that hasn't been resolved yet. If there's no, and that can be an important thing in these games, the order of the battles are resolved in. Um, if there's nowhere to retreat to, you can't do it, and you have to keep fighting. 
You don't have to worry about stacking as the defender retreating because stacking is only assessed at the end of a player turn. Then, if the defender did not retreat, the attacker is allowed to retreat. Um, and basically the same rules in two provinces containing their own armies. This becomes more problematic because chances are they have to check um, stacking right at, well, not stacking, uh, yeah, stacking right afterwards. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, let me see. Yeah, overpopulation limits. Let me keep that in mind because there used to be two things, stacking and overpopulation. And I think this game only has one limitation, but I don't know. Overpopulation in Britannia had a very specific meaning. And I don't remember seeing this. Well, I do remember seeing it, but I don't remember where it is. Yeah, remove armies from overpopulated. Um, Plains armies can hold... Okay, so it's stacking limitations, essentially. Plains provinces can support up to three armies. Highland can only support two. Uh, okay. So this is interesting. <laughs> they don't say what it is. Um, in Britannia, they, ver they have both stacking and overpopulation. And overpopulation specifically means you count up the number of provinces that you have times that multiplier. So it's basically, it's basically all provinces times two in Britannia. You're allowed to have that many armies total on the board. Stacking limitations were something more complex. Um, and absent being able to find anything else, I'm going to take this as the overpopulation one, which is every plains army you have allows you to have three armies on the board, or every Plains region. Every Highland allows you to have two on the board. They don't all have to be... It's not a matter that you can only have three units in the Plains. It's a matter that you're allowed that many armies total on the board. I don't know if that's what's intended in this game, because they don't make a uh, distinction there. But by using the term overpopulation and not stacking, I'm going to assume that... They're following the Britannia pattern, unless I see something that says differently. Okay. Um, in which case, the retreat, you know, as long as you have enough back areas, isn't going to be a problem. <coughs> it's just that you're not getting that province you're retreating from in your count. Um, otherwise, you go back and you start fighting... Um, you know, from section A or whatever. If the British, Ru French, Russians, or Germans are the only units in a Chinese province, um, and there's no foreign concession, they can place one there. And I think they get victory points for that. If an emperor is stranded in a province without any of his armies during a battle, the opposing army eliminates the emperor and gets victory points equal to the power factor of that emperor's country. Um, if you destroy the last army of a country from the board, not including any in the reinforcement box, that country has been conquered. Any armies from the conquered country remaining in the reinforcement box are also eliminated, as they can no longer be played. You give victory points equal to the power factor of the eliminated country. Um, you also get reinforcements equal to the power factor of the eliminated country. You absorb them. <coughs> Uh, in the reinforcement box for use in later turns, or possibly even in the same turn if you're in the midst of a uh, rebellion or invasion. Um, the foreign powers cannot be conquered in this game, sensibly. And if both attacking and defending armies simultaneously eliminate each other, both countries get the power factor points for conquering, but neither side is going to get any reinforcements because they're not on the board anymore. Um, now we get some weird rules here. Uh, the way can be conquered before turn seven. Okay. If that happens, the conquering army receives power points and reinforcement armies, and the way lose all their population points as usual. However, the way will still reappear on turn seven in North Korea. Uh, there's reinforcements that show in there. 
Okay. Uh, the two fawn, they can reappear and be conquered multiple times. The Taiping can be conquered in turn 21. Uh, with power factor points and reinforcements going to the conquering army as usual. Uh, however, the Taiping will still rebel again in turn 21 and they can be conquered again. The Qing cannot be eliminated in turn 17 as their starting base of power is in northern Russia. If all the Qing armies are removed from the board during turn 17, then the country that eliminated them did not get any power factor points or reinforcement armies. The Qing may continue their invasion on turn 18. And I don't know what's going on here. They're the only real exception to the conquering rules. The other countries can be conquered with points and armies going to the conquer, but the defeated armies still reappear as listed in moves. I, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, so, yeah. I, I hope we don't have a situation that brings this rule into question because it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Rebellions, invasions, and uprisings. These uh, occur in different ways, uh, but they're played out the same way. Essentially, they're a double move for the rebelling, invading, or uprising country. The country moves its armies, resolves battles, places new reinforcements onto the board, usually from conquered countries, then moves its armies and resolves its battles again. In order of play... Uh, parts three through five are repeated twice. I don't know what those are. Place new armies. Oh. Move armies and then fight. <coughs> okay. Where are we? Uh, each rebellion, invasion, or uprising is completed in one turn. In other turns, the armies will move and fight as normal. Rebellions happen when a new country stages a revolt. Rebellion occurs by the Han against the Quinn, by the Shu, Wu, and Wei against the Han during the Three Kingdoms, uh, by the Tang against the Sui, by the Ming against the Yuan, and by the Taiping twice against the Qing. Starting locations were previously described. After the rebellion has begun, the armies of the rebelling country can move and fight twice. That's going to be hard for me to remember, but... Once the three kingdoms are rebelled, have rebelled against the hand, they enter a special movement phase. The Shu move and fight, then the Wu move and fight, then the Wei move and fight. The Shu may now place reinforcements, move and fight again, followed by the Wu, followed by the Wei. Overpopulation is not determined until the end of the Wei army's second move. Invasions start from a pre-existing country, the Qin, Yuan, and Qing. And I'm probably pronouncing these wrong, but... Uh, Stage invasions, though both the Yuan and Qing have special rules for their three-move invasions. So the Yuan, they have a three-move invasion. During turn 15, they move and fight. They place reinforcements, say if they conquered someone. They move and fight again. They place reinforcements. They move and fight again. In addition, they have a bunch of advantages for that turn. Uh, they fight as if they're a foreign power. They ignore highlands. Uh, they can pass through opponents' territories at a one-to-one -one ratio. Blah, blah, blah. The Qing. The Qing have a three-move invasion during turn 18. Now, this is the Manchu. If, uh, yeah, I, I, you want to use the westernized uh, reference. Um, the Qing move and fight. They place reinforcements. They move and fight. They place reinforcements. They move and fight again. <coughs> during turn 18, they can pass through their opponent's territories at one-to-one -one ratio. Uprisings. Uprisings start within China from empty provinces. Uh, the Sui, Song, Nationalist, and Communists all begin with uprisings. They can move and fight twice during the uprising turn. Okay. I am not sure how you can guarantee that they are empty provinces. But we shall see. The Chinese Civil War. Turn 24 is a special move representing the Chinese Civil War between the Nationalists and Communists. Uh, each Nationalist and Communist province gets a free reinforcement army. Then the Nationalists move and resolve battles. And then after they move, 
they get a loyalty check on each province to see if it stays with them or turns communist. And we talked about that before. Chiang Kai-shek cannot switch. His province will be loyal. A province needs to roll a five or a higher to stay loyal. After that, the communists move and fight. Then the nationalists place reinforcements, move and fight again. Then the communists place reinforcements, move and fight again. So there's these kind of interleave turns that, just like the Three Kingdoms, to show a more fluid situation. Simultaneous countries. There are four countries in the game that are simultaneously controlled by two players. The six dynasties, the 16 kingdoms. See, that whenever this was referred to, it confused the hell out of me until I saw the cards. And yeah, that's what the kingdoms are called, well, what the countries are called. Six dynasties, 16 kingdoms, five dynasties, and 10 kingdoms. Points for owning provinces are given to both players. However, points for attacking and conquering only go to the player currently playing the country. In each case, one player places his reinforcement armies, moves and fights battles, and the other player gets any newly generated reinforcement armies onto the game turn, moves and fights battles again. If any reinforcement armies generated by one player first get used by the other player, the two players controlling the country are not required to agree on anything. They have separate turns, basically. Uh, remove armies from overpopulated regions. So again, if the overpopulation, it's counted over the entire nation, um, and there's no stacking limitation that I can see. Uh, you can score points in many ways. You can get it for controlling territories, attacking or conquering other countries or emperors, or building foreign concessions. Some points show up at the end of the round. Others are tallied immediately after you finish moving. Many territories get, uh, many countries get points for holding provinces, usually every three turns. The point values are on the scoring card. After certain turn numbers, a list of the provinces and the points that it's worth are on there. Some countries, though, get their territorial points immediately after they're done moving, and that'll be specified on the cards where it says immediately after move. Attacking countries, some points get, uh, some countries get points for uh, damaging other armies. Um, these are scored only if the army is attacking, if it says during attack. Otherwise, they can be scored whether you're the attacker or the defender. When you kill an emperor, you get the power factor point. When you kill a country, you get the power factor point. And uh, certain countries get points for their foreign concession creation. The nationalists can lose points during the game. If the nationalists are conquered completely by the, national, by the communists, they lose 10 points. This is in addition to the four-point gain the communists get for conquering the nationalists. That's their power rating. And then you score all the points and see who won. And it's just a points thing. Um, I don't expect this to be terribly exciting. Again, it's a Britannia-style game. Um, but I think it fills a place in my life right now that I want. I just, I don't respect these games very much. But one of the reasons I did want to get into this one was that concept of, hey, wait a minute, the emperors did absorb other, other peoples. Is that covered here? No, it's not, but I wanted to go ahead with it anyway since I read the rules. So then uh, I have been thinking about, you know, that in light of, uh, that concept in light of both China and also in light of how invasions works, and just trying to play around with, do I have some idea of a way that I can represent um, population differences in moving populations? Obviously there are population differences in empires of the Middle Ages. But populate, uh, population and religious differences, cultural differences between peoples, um, in addition, you know, a, as sort of a, uh, a factor where they're absorbed into another larger political entity. And whether or not I want to explore that too much, I, I can definitely see ways of representing it. You know, you could have a bunch of cubes or uh, a bunch of cubes or little pieces or something like that representing um, the population pieces and then move the actual armies over them. And in some cases you need to garrison places because the population is not really friendly with its uh, owning power. And especially during an invasion or something, that would be the case. And then you'd have sort of a population loyalty value for that culture's loyalty to the over, 
overarching kingdom. Now, what becomes interesting is in changes of dynasty, you could actually have um, the culture of the court essentially change, a la, again, empires of the Middle Ages, where you have, uh, you know, maybe... This could happen in multiple ways. So in the empires of the Middle Ages thing, it's you move your court to a place where, you know, the language and religion are different, and now you've just changed the nature of your empire. But I could also see it happening through um, the migrations of people, right? So in the case of, say, Rome, which I'm more familiar with, you would have something like, oh, look, uh, a goth has essentially taken over the Roman Empire. So now, you know, does this, how does this affect the Roman, the Romanized people from, you know, who've been assimilated in Italy or whatever, and maybe throughout more of the empire, uh, and how does it affect the Gothic side of things? And then you have another, another side of it, um, you might have intermarriages, which, you know, kind of link things together and make these two peoples more alike. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see something that's based more on the fluidity of, um, of the peoples and the dynasties uh, that are happening. So, you know, in China, when the Mongols come in, they don't seem to be hated in the same way that, like, the later Manchus are. They get absorbed in as the rulers for some time. And then when, you know, when their dynasty fails, they've sort of increased what is the standard baseline of China to include areas that maybe weren't part of weren't considered part of China before that. And then you see that definitely with the Manchu, where this area becomes essentially part of China. Um, and I'd have to, you know, I'd have to study more, and China would be the excellent example of this for me to look at, especially that Manchu uh, situation, to try to come up with a model that would work not just in China, but throughout, you know, the whole world, to play more of a a civilization type game, <laughs> if you will, uh, where, you know, and also cultures almost have their own technology in a, in a sense, where until they become assimilated, they have uh, their own ways of doing things that may be better in certain circumstances than the more civilized, um, less mobile um, population would be. There, I'm using civilized to really mean agricultural and citified rather than any other statement. Anyway, these are the kind of thoughts that I'm whirling around in my head and whether or not it's worth pursuing. Because what I felt like, and I don't feel like this is going to be the case with this game, that I'm going to really be like, oh, I need to do something like that. But I felt like that was what invasions should have been reaching towards, and it wasn't. It took a look at... Um, this idea of, okay, we're going to make the armies actual armies. And we make control of areas strangely persistent for things that are empires, but not for anything else. And it just, it didn't, it didn't hang together properly for me. It didn't make sense to me. And I think that there's a better model than trying to distinguish between kingdoms and empires and to try to say that kingdoms absolutely need to garrison all their territories except their capital, which, you know, has a counter on it, essentially. But I just don't buy that. I don't buy that a small, homogenous kingdom um, actually has to garrison its own territories more. And I sort I don't know. Anyway, I... Uh, I don't want to go too much into, into how that game uh, works, especially when I'm probably wrong about some aspects at this point. Um, but I know it didn't hang together in my mind, and I want to tackle that problem, and I think this is sort of the way to do it.
is to distinguish between populations and the military, have them both in the game. Now, one of the things with the Britannia system is it does not distinguish between populations and military. And the question is, how much do you not distinguish? Well, in this and in Britannia, they're all the military is kind of abstracted. The population has to be occupying areas. In Hispania, we get a little bit more towards a military flavor to the units, where there are night units and stuff like that, which is getting me towards that invasions level of detail. Invasions, it's very clear that the units are just military units. They don't have to occupy every location. And that's getting me towards what I'm aiming for. But I want to represent those cultural population pockets as well, and, and the concepts of like religious changes in the cultures and stuff, possibly splitting a culture into two similar cultures. Um, you know, so for example, you have uh, Semitic people in the Near East, but with significant religious differences, both, uh, you know, Muslim, Christian, and, and Jewish, all in that same area, though all fairly closely related in terms of um, uh, so, so, some of the aspects of, of, of their languages, so, some of the aspects of uh, the genealogy, etc. And what matters, you know, well, obviously, we don't want to go into too much detail on whatever it's going to be, I think, for a game. But it could just be represented by this, diff by this um, uh, separation as a population splits, and in some cases the religious differentiation could be so strong that it actually causes a wider break than you would see between two completely alien cultures um, who have no reason to hate each other. So, I've got ideas like that whirring through my head. Anyway, uh, I'll get to playing this fairly soon, but we're out of battery again.